Uh, Job, the 42nd chapter, we're going to read three verses of scripture, beginning at verse number 10. Job 42 and 10 reads like this, And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then came there unto him all his brethren, and all his sisters, and all that had been of his acquaintance before, and did eat bread with him in his house. And they bemoaned him and comforted him over all the evil that the Lord, or all the evil that God suffered, uh, had brought upon him to be upon him. Every man also gave him a piece of money, and every one an earring of gold. For the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. For he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, a 1,000 yoke of oxen, and a 1,000 she asses. He had also seven sons and three daughters. If you would catch a neighbor by the hand and look him in the eye and say, Neighbor, this is the turning of your captivity. Look at the one behind you and say, neighbor, this is the turning of your captivity. Hallelujah. Sometimes we have to get to a certain point in our lives before there can be a turning point. Sometimes the Lord suffers things to be. He's not, he's not doing it, but he suffered for it to be. There's a lot of things that's going on now that God is not involved with, but he's allowing it to be. God did not originate poverty, but he's allowing it to be. Can you say amen? God does not create sickness, amen, but he's suffering it to be. And when Jesus comes, he's going to put that final enemy, the enemy of death, sickness, and disease, and poverty, underfoot. Can you say amen? And that's the devil. But I want you to know that in this day and time, we as a body of Christ, you know, we ought not to have to get to our weakest point in order to get strong. You know, you don't have to wait till you get low to reach up. Some folks say, well, I was so low, I, I, I was reach up to touch bottom. Well, you didn't have to get there to realize that God was able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than you could even ask or think. Can you say amen? And of course, God allowed... Hallelujah, Job, to go through what he went through because God wanted to prove a point. Now, when you read in St. John's Gospel, the ninth chapter, you find out that there was a man there that was born blind. And the question was put to Jesus, Oh, Lord, well, was this man born blind because of his parents or because of himself or because of his sin? Jesus said, Neither. Sometimes folks, you know, you go through things and folks want to say, honey, you're going through this because you're deep in sin. And you're going through because you won't obey God. And you're going through because you won't listen to me. Well, maybe it might be a little truth to that, but it don't have to always be so. You're still following me. And so the Lord told him that the reason why this was in 9th chapter John, John, because you see, he wanted to be glorified. That this was done that the Son of Man might be glorified. A lot of times God will take a mess and turn it into a miracle. He'll take something ugly and make it pretty. Y'all still with me? He'll take the devil's junk and turn it around and make it work in your favor. Well, the Bible said we all know that all things work together. For the goods that we know. He's not talking about the world. We, the body of Christ, we know. And this is why that I'm surprised and why so many church folks are confused. And they have to question, well, why am I going through this? And why is this one saying this? And why is this one acting this way? Well, we know that all things work together for the good. To them that love the Lord and to them that are called according to his purpose. God's not working it out for everybody, but them that love him and call according to his 
purpose. Some folk are just in the church because they want some place to hide. Some folk is there because nowhere else to go until the weekend. Y'all ain't helping me. And then some folks is there because, well, it looks nice in there. Or I like the music or the choir sound good. Or I enjoy reverence preaching. But you see, after all of that, you're going to have to stand before God for the deeds that's done in your body, whether it's good or bad. And this is what's going on now. We are letting folks sidetrack us, amen, with stupid stuff. And we don't realize that our souls are at stake here. When all of the dust has been cleared off, you're going to be standing before God by yourself. I don't care what you're going through now or what's in the future for you. You're going to have to give an account, amen, for yourself. Come on, say amen. Well, the Bible says the point of the man wants to die, and after that, judgment. So now there's captivity coming. There's going to be bondages coming. There's going to be tribulations and trials coming. You're not going to tell me you walk with God. No need to tell me you're going to walk with God and not go through nothing. And need not for you to tell me that some of the things we go through, all of us, some of us have brought it on ourselves. I think we've all done that one point or another. So no need of us telling them blame it on the devil all the time because we give him so much credit that God can't get a blessing in there edgewise because we continually giving him credit. The devil made me do this and he made me say this and the devil is in them. I discern the spirit and you wouldn't know the gift of discernment if it walked up with you with a red hat on. And you see, we want to blame folks for our shortcoming. But then Paul said, let every man examine himself. Can I talk to you today? Amen. And when we examine ourselves, then and then the scripture said when we do that, we need not any man should to judge us because we're able to see ourselves and we can judge ourselves. Can you say amen? And you know, you're not going to tell me that just trouble is going to run you just that far away from God. Trouble sometimes, most of the time, it ought to bring you to God. Some say trouble in my way, I have to cry sometime. Later, wake at night, but that's all right. Jesus will fix it for me. Huh? Then he said, count it all joy. Y'all still follow me? When you fall in divers, divers mean many temptations. Knowing that the trying of your faith, it worketh patience. Now, if you look at the average church member, the minute that electric bill is due and they can't pay it, they ain't got a bit of joy. <laughs> or the minute the phone bill or the cable bill is due, forget the joy, honey. Where you going to give me some money? And if I can't get the money, I don't want to be bothered with nobody. Pull down the cage. Don't call me. Don't say nothing to me. Well, you're not doing what the Bible say do. And yet we hollering, I want to be like Jesus. How I long to be like him. Hallelujah. And you just can't on and not paying a bit of mind to what the Bible is saying. Did you not know that the joy of the Lord is the strength? And sometimes when you get some joy, your strength will come back. Your strength in faith. Your strength in patience. Your strength in tolerance. I mean, when you get some joy, it brings all these things. But you sitting, bless God, like a frog in a lug and don't know which way to turn and can't wave your hand and talking about nobody knows the trouble I see. And you just making it sad for yourself and everybody because with that kind of spirit, it's doomed to hit somebody. And you just going to worry other folk and you too. And somebody suddenly come on and say, hey, honey, just take the money. Go ahead on. Go ahead. And that's not the spirit in which we ought to carry. Somebody say amen. Well, in this time, you can look at your situation as it was in the time of Moses. For God said to Moses, these enemies that you see, you will see them no more. This is the turning of your captivity. Bless God and the word captivity means bondage. It means entrapment. It means uh, taken for prisoner or as a prisoner. And you can say what you will or may, the devil has caught us up. Everybody, he's caught us everybody up one time or another. It's just like a spider, bless God, making his web. And if that fly keeps fooling around, that web is going to catch him. And you see, but you know, you don't have to stay in the web. I said you don't have to stay in the web. Sometimes the Lord allows certain things to be so that you can see yourself. 
Sometimes the Lord allows certain things to be to let you know you're not as strong as you thought you was. And you don't have what you started with. Can you say amen? This is what we need to do. We need to recognize that the body of Christ needs a restoration. My God, we need to reassemble ourselves. We need to reinstate ourselves. We need to restore ourselves and come back to the basics of salvation. I remember when you didn't hear the word holiness in the church, you felt like, I don't belong in this church because God's a holy God. But now when you hear the term holiness or sanctification, folk get offended. They get upset with you. When you look over the television, you don't hear preachers talking about that. The biggest thing going on now is faith and prosperity. Honey, God wants everybody to be rich. Well, somebody missed it. Because when you read in the book of St. John, Jesus said, not John or Peter, Jesus said, the poor will have with us always. Come on, say amen. But it's a cycle program. Amen. It's a policy that the devil has put in the church. And some of y'all have signed that insurance policy. Looking for some prosperity when you're not walking in the true fellowship. Now, God will take care of his own. It's a fact that David said, I was young, but now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed beg for bread. I wish that up of all that you would prosper and be in hell. And we don't want to lose sight on this. That Matthew 6.33 says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things will be added to you. You don't have to go crazy bless God seeking for the material just seek the kingdom and everything else will be added to it because it goes with the program. Still with me? Notice here Hallelujah, we find out that the Bible said Job turned the captivity. The Lord turned Job's captivity when he learned how to pray for his friends. Now, Job had a few friends that was judging him, and he, they were still friends. Amen. He had about four of them. Amen. They come to the conclusion that if this man is this bad off, he was blessed before. But the only thing that could bring him down is that Job was a sinner. And so they said that to him, Eliphaz said, and let him know that man, I tell you what. In other words, you are like this because you sin. And Job couldn't say that. Now, before they said that to Job, they sat and looked at Job for seven days. Just staring at him with all them balls on him, you know. Here is the richest man in the land. And my Lord, now he don't have a plug nickel. And what's going on with him? Amen. Well, something had to happen. And they just stared at him. Have y'all ever been to church and folks is like in a concentration camp? They just sit and stare at you like you're in a concentration camp. And they're just concentrating on you. <laughs> Somebody say man. And they're just trying to see. And what is it? But I'm here to let you know that after seven days and Job was considering, then they opened up and Job began to let them know. No, no, it didn't come from this. He didn't have the answer. And so he got a bit upset and cursed his mother's womb and the son and so forth and so on. And no need you looking at me. Some of you done curse more than that. Yeah, bless the Lord. But I want you to know, hallelujah, but Job came out of it. Now, have you know the story of Job? It seems like that every time we hear the message of Job preach, they only talk on the suffering part and the part that he got taken. But they never read all the way to the end of the book and find out the man got back double because of his suffering. Amen. More than he had in the beginning. Oh yeah, we 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 hear the song, you know, talking about Job's servants come a run in. Y'all know the song, Job your cattle is dead, and so we just muting that and singing it. Job's cattle dead, kids dead, wife cursed Job and died. Called the woman a fool. You don't know what it's like when you got a husband that's walking with God, and then everything turn on him. Folks turn on him. Amen. Money get low, things get rough, and she don't know which to do because if she's been praying up, most women. And don't pray up because they got a good strong husband. They'll just let him do the praying and when it's good time for them to be prayed up, they haven't prayed up. I'm not saying all of them. Don't y'all fall out with me. But you know, a lot of times that does happen. So now, no need you saying that your wife backs it because she told him, curse God and die. Well, you see, I, don't, I wasn't there, so I'm not going to put the woman in hell. I just seen folks do worse than that. Come on, say it, man. I, I done seen them shoot their husbands. 
and then get up in church and speak in tongues. Say, the Lord said unto thee. Come on, say something to me. I mean, shoot them. I'm telling you, I done seen them cut them and put them in the hospital. Say amen. And the folks say, get for him, praise the Lord. Get for him. The Lord was in that thing. I know it wasn't the Lord using that night. But it looked like God gave me the strength of Samson, and I cut that day. Now, I done seen that happen. And they still talking about, you heard the Lord say, and folks still how they man. You know I'm telling you the truth. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so, God... Allowed. Now, the history does not record why Job suffered. Now, did you not know that the, the length of the suffering of Job was only 90 days? Three months. But I tell you what, it probably seemed like three years or more. Because when you're going through, time seems like there's no end to it. And it seemed like I just can't get, no matter what I do, I can't get out of this. The more I do, the worse thing gets. And this is where the devil gets us. Because he say, well, they keep your mind on him. He'll keep you in perfect peace, whose mind is staying on the Lord. Well, it's between your mind and the peace where the devil gets you. Right in between there, you see. And so we, we quote in scriptures, but we're not listening to what we quote. Oftentimes we quote the scripture, oh, my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. But if you look around you, you don't find many folk that don't have a knowledge now. It isn't that they are destroyed for the lack of. Many times they're destroyed because of the knowledge. Huh? Their knowledge is working against them and they're not doing what they know to do. And therefore the Lord said you shall be whipped with many stripes. I ain't in the Bible, am I, y'all? Amen. So you see, what Job experienced, and all we see is that, oh, he died and suffered, or rather he suffered and he cursed his mother's wound, and my Lord, the man went through so much, and, and, and we don't know why he was going through. He lost everything, and we hear about man that's born of a woman a few days and full of trouble. And But you see, as you read on, God got tired of Job's complaining. And when you look at the 38th chapter, for example, of the book of Job, you will find, well, let's just turn over there. You don't mind, do you? Well, since we're back here anyhow, notice this, the 38th chapter of the book of Job, and just let's look at the third verse. Hallelujah. Notice this. Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer thou me. Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast the understanding. Where, wh who hath laid the measure thereof? If thou knowest, or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? In other words, God got sick of Job's complaining. Even though he was in bondage, even though he was in captivity, you ought to know that sometimes while you're in the midst of your trouble, the song said, don't wait till the battle is over. You can shout now. While you're in the midst of your trouble, you ought to be able to have some type of praise, some kind of joy and victory. Amen. But now Job got to griping and complaining, and the Lord said, hush your mouth, boy. Where was you when I created the earth and laid the foundation? Where was you when I measured thereof? You don't have nothing to say. Bless God, amen, because you're blessed to come this far. Because I've got the power to take your life, and I've got the power to give it back to you. Come on, say amen. And see, what is happening in this day and time is that the church is experiencing, amen, a turning point. You want to know why, bless God, the body of Christ is almost in chaos. Amen. There is a, a, a decisions, a great decisions to be made. And folks have lost their view on how to make decisions. We're starting to believe in things that we didn't used to believe. We're starting to go agree, agree with things that we didn't used to agree with. And we're starting to go along with stuff and compromise that we didn't used to and we want to say well times are changing and we're going to have to realize that God is too that's a lie because the scripture said God is the same day, same God today yesterday and forevermore he's a God that cannot lie you still with me and so we're going through a drought period for, for example in the midst of the church yes people are making noise yes they are falling out on the floor and yes they're 
they're even dancing as they say. But when all of that noise is over and all of that speaking in tongue and falling out is over, when they go home, they still have no victory. Can you say amen? Yes, we're going through it seemingly like we're going through a spiritual low in the church where in Sunday morning they'll come and my God, they'll be high up in the spirit and come back Sunday night and folks is sitting up looking like totem poles because they don't know what, what what's going on, what move of the spirit or what. Prophecy will go on and they don't know whether it's of God or honey. It seems like to me it's the devil speaking and then somebody say, well, I don't feel it's the devil speaking. I feel it's the flesh speaking. And it's the same thing. Amen. And some say, honey, I know it was God. And folks is off in their prophecies. They're telling people the Lord say such and such a thing and is nowhere in the Bible. Come on now. People's views of God have changed. Their standard has changed. And according to Jeremiah 51, he said, publish a standard among the people. Their standard has changed. And they got their, their ideas. They all mixed and messed up. And sometimes when you counsel folks once or twice, it takes more than one or two counseling to get them all in line. Because they done fooled out there with all these off folks and off doctrines and off churches. And tell when they get done, when the devil get done with them, they got six or seven different ideas and don't know what in the world is going on. Say amen. And uh, what we need to do is realize that the church is turning, is turning from its captivity. Y'all ain't saying nothing. Amen. We cause ourselves to come, amen, from a blessing almost to a cursing. Because you see, when we look at our churches, we've got our churches have become more beautiful now than they ever have been. I mean, when I come along, we were blessed to have a piano, an upright piano. Now we got baby grands and carpet churches. We We've got brand new pews and fine land, you know, fine churches. And my God, we've got the, all kinds of beautiful lights and musical equipment. Amen. We've got the top microphones and we've got, we've got bylaws and doctrines and dues. We've got presidents and bishops and overseers. We've got district elders and elders and apostles. We've got, we, we've got, oh my God, we've got the education department. We've got the children department. We've got folks in our church that's more educated than they ever have been. Bless God and what has happened, we've taken our eyes off of God and we went off in the wrong direction. Say amen. I'm going to be through shortly, but I want you to notice something. There's a turning going on because everybody is not following this itching ear message. You see, the Bible declares that there's coming a time where folk are going to heat unto themselves. Amen. Preachers and teachers itching ears. In other words, they're going after what they want to hear. Don't nobody want to hear nothing about, amen, about getting delivered now from cigarettes and camels and lucky stripes and booze and whiskey and wine and turpentine and Atlantic City whoremongering homosexuality and lesbianism. Folks don't want to hear that no more. So they're going to find somebody that won't hit it. They'll find somebody, bless God, that'll tell you how much money you can get. But honey, I'm here to let you know that you can get all the dollars you can get and you can get all the cars and fine houses you can get. The facts yet remains that Hebrew 12, 14 say, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Can you say amen? So I want you to know that holiness is the oldest message that God has. I mean, even from the beginning, God told the folk in Leviticus, be ye holy, for I am holy. Can you say amen? And the devil is the devil is a manipulator because in the Old Testament, you find about familiar spirit. And the Lord gave me this several years ago that that demon of familiar spirits is coming back in a strong way. Actually, it never left, but he's going to try to raise his head up again. Because now you got folks coming in with off attitudes. They too familiar with one another and they don't come on here. And I'm gonna tell you what, and you know each other and don't know each other. Isn't that strange? That's a familiar spirit when you know folks and you really don't know them. Amen. You get the norm from he said, they said it. You know them from what you think you see and what you feel. And that's called a familiar spirit. You ain't gotta say nothing. Amen. But you really don't know that person. You just know him from gossip. 
You just know them from foolishness and mess in flesh. Bless God. And so that familiar spirit is disrupting our church. It's causing discord among brother, strife and hatred, jealousy and malice. Folks are jealous of one another's dresses and clothes. Cars and suits, jealous over one another's houses, and jealous over positions, and fighting for a position. Honey, I'm not after no position. I'm after God. Somebody say, man. Everybody, and they're fighting over it. They can not come in with attitude. Coming in mad, sad, looking like 6 o'clock. And then they're leaving mad, sad, looking like 6 o'clock. I don't care how much Holy Ghost is bouncing all around them. When I'm upset, forget you, Holy Ghost. When I'm upset, forget no, the power, forget joy. But until the first of the month, when I get my check, and uh, whether it be old age or welfare, that's when my joy comes back. When I get my check, and, and I can go on and get me some chicken, then I'm able to feel pretty good. Come on, say man. But I'm going to tell you what, when I came along, bless God, silver and gold, we had none. But such as I have, I give I thee. We gave everything to God. I mean, you couldn't tell when folk didn't have no money. They came in dancing. They came in with praise. If they came in sick, they went away well. If they came in down, they went away up. If they came in sad, they went away with gladness. For the joy of the Lord is my strength. Lift your hands and say Everybody trying to judge everybody. And where have you been? Are you pregnant? Where have you been? Did you elope? None of your nosy business. What you ought to do is learn how to pray and stop playing. It's time for a turning point. Bless God, the demons is in our churches, cutting up, killing folks, making them sick, taking our houses and cars, having us fight one another, and we so busy trying to look at somebody else. Amen. But it's time to go back to Mark 16 when the Bible says that behold, I'm giving you some power to tread upon serpents. And I'm giving you power to heal the sick. I'm giving you power. And if any drink, any deadly thing, and it will not hurt you, it's not just for the apostles, but it's for them that believe. And after the Holy Ghost has come, you shall have good of us power. And now you just tell folk to stand up and the spirit of fall over. When I came along, you had to wait before God. You got at the altar and they taught you how to carry. They taught you how to wait, but they don't do that no more. My God, we hit the old fashioned stuff. It made you love your neighbor. It made you treat everybody right. And somebody stood up in the crowd. Amen. And they said, I know a man from Galilee. And if you ain't sin, he'll set you free. And because of foolishness, this age joke is walking the land. It's attacking everybody. But then I know a man from Galilee. If you got AIDS, he'll set you free. Say yes. Say yes. And God is bringing about a harvest. There's a turning point in the harvest. What you mean, Brother Preacher? God is sending folks to our churches that's not going to pull against us, but going to pull for us. God is sending folks to our churches that's going to get in with this vision, get in with the message, get in with the move of God. Say amen. God going to send folks to our churches that's not going to fight the gifts, that's not going to fight the move of God, that's not going to fight Holy Ghost and faith. And the Bible says, come out from among them and be separated. I'll be your God and you shall be my people. Until there come a separation, there ain't going to be no deliverance. But we're going to have to separate ourselves from phony balloons, separate ourselves from hypocrisy, and separate ourselves from foolishness and contrariness, disobedience and mess. If you're not going God's way, I don't want to be bothered with you. Now the Bible says they are things strange when you don't run with them. But that's all right. If I gotta walk alone, I just walk alone. For God, I live, and for God, I die. Folks that's coming to the church, and they're coming for something, but it's so dead and cold in our churches until you can ice skate down at the pulpit. And who's standing behind that pulpit, y'all? Reverend Polar Bear. Somebody. 
mighty soul man, cold as ice, the first church of Frigidaire, no deliverance, no life, no Holy Ghost, no power, no separation, no holiness, the devil is a liar, I'm not going to compromise just for a crowd, I will not compromise just to get a special one, come on, say yeah, for a move of God. If the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the sinner and the ungodly appear? Oh, we're going to have to get in shape. When you're in the reserves, they call you a certain amount of times in a year to see if you can stay in shape. Amen. Our spirit man, bless God, need to lose some weight. Our spirit man need to build up some strength. Hallelujah. Instead of us lifting our Bibles, we're lifting our plates. Instead of us speaking in tongues, we're speaking in lies. Oh God, instead of us prophesying, we're proper lying. And it's time for the church to come again. Amen. The Bible teaches us in Corinthians that the Israelites, while they were in the wilderness, they sat down to eat and they rose up to play. Amen. And the church is playing church. We're looking church and acting church and talking church and going to church. But the church ain't in us. Jesus said, upon this rock I'll build my church. And the hell gates shall not prevail or take it over. Thank God for his word. Wherewith shall a young man cleanse his ways by taking heed to the will of the Lord. How many of you realize it's a turning point? Amen. It's a turning point. The war couldn't last too long. It was time for it to turn. Amen. Time for it to turn. You've got mail. Panic that sunk. They tell me they had everything on there but a holy Bible. You can't hold up that way too long. It was a turning point. Sometimes pressure is brought to bear, and if you don't give it to God, it's going to turn you to another way. Hallelujah. Oh, but I hear Peter saying, cast your cares on him, because he cares for you. Come and dine, the master is calling. Come and dine. We shall feast at his table all the time. He who fed the multitude turned the water into wine. The question was said, Master, don't you care for us? He said, Oh, ye of little faith, he rebuked the wind. Oh, he cares about us. And he cares for us. All that's left is time to live for Jesus. We got to come back to the water creek and draw from the wells of salvation. Listen to me, every one of you. God's got his hand on you. Get serious about that. That's God's hand. It is not a degree. It is not a feeling. It is not some type of thought. It is the hand of God. It's on your life. Don't let nothing take that. Get violent. Amen. We're going to read Psalms 103 and 5 first. 103 and 5 first. Who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagle. So that thy youth, or that thy strength, is renewed or restored like the eagle. Isaiah the 40th chapter, verse number 28. Has thou not known, has thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching for his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. 
They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. Say amen to the word. Folks, the time has come where we that are saved and born again, you're going to have to have power with God. You're going to have to have power to cast demons out. Because devils are coming on in the wrong. Amen. And you will agree with me when I say that we are in a spiritual warfare. A spiritual battle. Amen. You have to get up every morning ready to do battle with the enemy. You just can't get up and say, well, I'm not going to fast today because the church I've been fasting faithful for the last six months. And I'm going to just skip this day and eat myself a nice little breakfast. That may be the day, amen, that your gallbladder go to acting up. That may be the day, bless God, that you get in this unexpected letter in the mail stating that they're going to take everything you got because you had made your payment. Y'all listening to me? That may be the day that your kid, bless God, get hit on a bicycle. You can't take no one day off because the enemy is trying to wear out the saints of the Most High. Are y'all listening? He's trying to discourage the body of Christ. He's got folks at each other's throat. There's a great spirit of chaos and confusion. Don't nobody want to listen to nobody. Nobody can't tell nobody nothing. And nobody ain't going to do nothing they don't want to do. And so this is all going on. Now all of this knowledge and Bible scriptures that we've got shut up inside of us. And when I say that I'm talking about the body of Christ now. It's not meaning too much because folks that took their little knowledge and put it to the side. And the majority of the body of Christ is operating from flesh operating from their own feelings and how they see God and how they understand God and what they think the church ought to be doing and what the church ought not to be doing. Well, the Bible tells us in Romans 10 that they have a zeal of God and not according to knowledge, for they're going about establishing their own righteousness instead of the righteousness of God. Y'all listening? So that means that what we have is a folk, is a body or a church where people have made up their own rules to play with. Now you can't play on no team with your own rules. If you rough up the quarterback, it's a penalty. Amen. If you're offside, it's a penalty. If you clip somebody, it's a penalty. Now there's certain things that you do that's more of a penalty than another. Now you rough up, rough up the quarterback, that's 15 yards. All sides, that's five yards. So there's some things that God holds you strongly more committed to than he does some other things. Say amen. Now, much known, much required. We're living in a time where people need to renew their strength. There is a warfare going on in our minds. There is a warfare going on in our spirit. There is a warfare going on in our homes. Say amen. There are warfares going on in the church. The Bible says that a man's foe is that of his own household. Other words, if you can get along with folks in the church, you don't have no problem with folks outside of the church. And have you noticed that people are very easily nowadays to be discouraged? And have you noticed that salvation has been so liquid down and so smoothed down to let everybody talk about, I'm saved. Everybody talking about, I'm born again. You can talk to folk that you know is wrong, and you know it's off, and they got scriptures to try to make themselves justified that I'm saved. Well, the Bible is right, and every man is a liar. And because you, when you're born again, the Bible said, Behold, if any man be in Christ, He's a new creature. Now you're not going to tell me you're born again and still doing and saying and going the same places that you used to go. Amen. So I want you to catch your neighbor by the hand and repeat these words. Renew strength <laughs> as the eagle. Look at somebody else and say renew strength as the eagle. Well, praise the Lord. Now we're not going to be too long, but I want to share with you what God has got to say. The Bible said God satisfies our mouth with good things. It is his pleasure to give us of his kingdom. Can you say amen? And he wants, the Bible said, then he will renew the youth. He'll renew your strength. Bless God as the eagle. The youth there means strength. He will renew your strength. Your strength shall be restored as the eagle. Well, why would you say the eagle? 
first of all, in studying the ego. <clears throat> now, I want you to understand, this is not C.L. Franklin up here talking about the ego steers his nest. That cause, now, I'm not talking about the ego steering his nest. I'm talking about God steering your nest. Somebody say amen. And to see folk a mess, take that mess and say, hi, he got that from C.L. Franklin. I don't get nothing from them boys. Them boys need the Holy Ghost. And of course, my Lord, he's been dead so long now because I'm sure a lot of you youngsters never even heard of it. Amen. But I want you to understand something here. As the scriptures have declared, first of all, God gives a strong resume of himself. When you look at the 28th verse, now haven't you known, haven't you heard that the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth, he fainteth not. God never gets tired. God never gets weary. God never gets depressed, nor God never gets oppressed. God never backslides. God never sins. God don't need prayer. God don't need hands laid on him. God don't need encouragement. God don't need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Come on, say amen. So why would you say that, preacher? I'm saying that to say this. Because your God is your God, you always know that when you get weak, you've got a fountain of life that you can go to and draw strength from. I don't understand how folks can be saved and backslide so easily. Because, you see, obviously they didn't have nothing to start with. Because, amen, when you really get wrapped up, tangled, and tied into this God that I'm talking about, you can't get away from him that easy. You just don't walk off and leave God and come back and walk off. Some folks can walk off, leave God, drink like a fish. Come on here, take more, don't hang out, run, chase, or hop. Amen. And then come back and cry a little bit and say, God, then accept it. No, no, folks, it takes more than that. Because if you love me, you would keep my commandments. Help me through here. So I want you to know God wants to renew you. Haven't you heard what he has noticed? Neither is he weary. There is no searching for his understanding. God never has a problem with knowledge. God has no problem with folk. With, with, with God has no problem in remembering things because he's God. He has no problem understanding the word because he's God. Now I want you to notice something here. As the Bible said, he gives us power to the faith. Bless God. Notice he gives us power. Strength is another word. To those that are weary and faint. And to them that have no might, he increased their strength. To them that don't have that pick up and get up and go, he will increase your strength. How many know that? Now I want you to notice in Isaiah the 52nd chapter and the first verse, it says, Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. He's not talking to the sinner. He's not talking, bless God, to the backslider. He's not talking to somebody, bless God, who's not really praying. But he's talking to those of us who are walking in fellowship with him. He's talking to those of us that are living a right standing or a righteous life. He's talking to us who profess to be, amen, people, men and women of God. In other words, the word awake means to quicken, get on up quickly, amen, and put on strength. Oh, Zion, oh, Zion indicates the church. Now, somebody said, Rev, how you put on strength? You know what it takes to keep you safe. You know what it takes to get you back in fellowship with God. You know what it takes to keep you in fellowship. You know what it takes to keep a smile. Bless God to keep you in touch. Some people have to do a little more praying than others. Some have to do a little more consecrating than others. Some have to do a little more studying. Sometimes in order to stay strong, you got to stay away from certain folks. Come on, you know your weak areas. And there's one thing about folks. Folks uh, know their weak areas and then expect God to take it over and do something. No, the Bible says put on strength. Whatever area you know that you're weak in, you start working on that. Amen. But you got to wake up first. You got to arise and get up out of the slump. You got so many folks that have seen so many church people. Seen so many church people backslide. See, so many church folks do wrong and get up and do wrong till you can just go somewhere and go sit in a corner and say, well, we nobody saved. And, and as much as I try, and, and, and I see so much junk and mess going in the church, you got two problems. Your first problem is that you got your eyes on the wrong people. 
Your second problem is you're not obeying the word. The word of God says, save yourself from this crooked and untoward generation. Take your eyes off of everybody else. I don't care if 99% of the church is hypocrites. You be the 1% that's not. The Bible says in Job 20 that the hypocrite, the joy of a hypocrite is but for a moment. So you can't hypocrite too long because after a while, sorrow and sadness, grievousness, conviction will hit you. Amen. And whether you admit it or not, you can't rest, you can't sleep. Bless God, you're not happy because you are a hypocrite. Say amen. So we as a people, may, amen, we got this God give us power, amen, to those that are faint. Sometimes you get faint, you get weary, bless God, and sometimes you get to the place where you feel like giving in and giving up. Now let me remind you, if you feel like that all day, every day, you not faint, you just ain't saved. Amen. It's quiet when I'm talking this way. Some folks feel depressed all the time. I just feel like backsliding. I just feel like giving up. I feel like drinking. I feel like smoking. Now, when you was out there in the world, when you got depressed, did you say, I feel like going to the church. I feel like getting saved. I feel like getting in the prayer line. Mm, I feel like speaking in tongues. No, you didn't say that, did you? No, what you said, the next time I see him, I'm going to cut his throat. Next time I see her, I'm going to knock her out. No, you did what you felt was right to do. And listen, when you get saved, in order to stay saved, you got to do saved things. You can't hang with ungodly folk and worldly folk and be strong. Some of y'all don't have no conviction. You'll hang with anything. Trash and all Lord. You just hang with mess in the street. But in order for you to be concerned, considered as a Christian, look upon as a Christian, and put respect to everything, you got to come away from toxic mess. Well, you know, this was my friend before I got saved. Now you are saved, and it should not be that close relationship no more. He that is friend with the world is enmity with God. Is that in James, the fourth chapter? Well, you see, I don't understand you folks that's supposed to be so close to the Lord. I praise every day. And got buddies hanging around smelling like beer. Y'all ain't helping me. And got friends and girlfriends hanging around, take more dope and drugs, lips black from drugs, eyes red from drugs. And you're talking about, I'm saying the devil been talking to you. Because when you get into God, amen, there's a change. I ain't got no help. If you want God to renew your strength, you've got to get over in the area where your strength can be renewed. God, I'm just about through here. My God, you got freedom. The reason why the eagle acts proud and full of spirits and strength, and he's courageous. Amen. The Bible said, be courageous in the Lord. Be courageous because he feels freedom. He feels power. And if you notice, the Bible said, I'll give you power to those that faint, and to them that have no might, he will increase your strength. You've got to act this thing out. Don't just be hearers of the word. You've got to be doers of the word. The word of God says, after the Holy Ghost has come, you shall have power. We've been quoting that scripture for umpteen years. But then the problem is that we're not acting on it. We'll say we got it, but when somebody needs prayer, call the elder. Call the pastor. Call this one. No, you do it. The scripture said in Mark 16 that you'll lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Can you say amen? Well, amen, we have to present ourselves in an apologetic way for the way we live. I don't. We have to present ourselves as if I'm sorry that I'm holding it. I'm sorry that we dress holy. I'm sorry that we speak in tongues. I'm not. It doesn't care how you don't like it or what you don't agree with. It's in the Bible. Come on, say man. And you see, and we present ourselves, and this is the way holiness folk have done for years. We presented ourselves in an apologetic way that we, I'm sorry for who I am. You don't see Baptist folk doing it. You don't see the Methodists. You don't see the Presbyterians. You don't see the Catholic folk doing it. Come on, y'all. The Bible said, after the Holy Ghost comes, you shall have power. Then Hebrews 12, 14 says, follow peace with all men and holiness without, which no man shall see the Lord. That scripture just as big as day. And we folks trying to be charismatic as 
fast as we can. We'll come to church any old kind of way. Come all in the sanctuary in slacks. Don't even have on no underwear, no bra, nothing. And just come all in the church in slacks for choir rehearsal, for service. Y'all don't like me. And the reason why these empty brain preachers are doing that is because they're scared they might lose their little crowd. But the word is the one that draws. Somebody say, man, if you tell the truth, somebody will hear. If you tell the truth, somebody will follow you. The Bible calls these preachers in Isaiah 56 and 10 dumb dogs. They don't like me. That can't even Bartello in here. My God, they listen to this broadcast. They upset with me. But God said, if you're going to renew your strength as an evil, you must gather yourself with courageousness and freedom and liberty in the spirit. Clap your hands, somebody, and say amen. Oh, yes. <laughs> Another thing you will notice about the eagle, especially the golden eagle. They are known for their beauty. Bless God. They are known because of their strength. Their wings, hallelujah. Amen. Stretches seven feet wide. Bless God. And they can get caught up in the breeze, in the air. And they can carry loads twice their size. Now they only weigh eight to 13 pounds. Amen. They even lay eggs almost that much. But you see, one thing about a golden eagle, amen, he knows how to glide because of his beauty. And I'm going to tell you something about the beauty of saints. The Bible says, uh, be holiness is beautiful. The beauty of holiness. Can you say amen? And I'm here to let you know that as the eagle, bless God, amen, glides gracefully. If he sees trouble, he'll go around the other way. You have born again people. The Bible talks about this on the very appearance of evil. When you see amen stuff going on, go another way. If you know you're not strong enough to handle it, go another way. If you know you can't take it, go another way. If you want to renew your strength, you've got to learn how to shun the appearance of evil. Some folk look for evil. Some folk go after it. Some folk enjoy it. Some people enjoy hearing stuff, knowing dirt. Amen. They like alley dogs and alley cats. Go all down the alley and pull out all the garbage and eat all the garbage they can get. Come on here. Some folk got buzzard spirits. Buzzards eat filth and, and mess. Y'all ain't saying nothing. Some folk, bless God, got jackass spirits. They kick it all the time. Amen. Some folk, bless God, hallelujah, got dog spirits. Just barking and biting on folk. They got cannibal spirits. You used to hit some Pentecostals. Amen. But one thing about the eagle, bless God, amen, the golden eagle was beautiful. Then you have what is called the bald eagle. The bald eagle is a wise bird. And if you can tell me, you can say anything you want. If you don't have wisdom living for God, you're not going to make it. Come on. Wisdom is the principal thing. And all I get is get an understanding. Bless God, we need to learn that wisdom is necessary. If any man like wisdom, let him ask. God, if you don't understand your ministry, if you don't understand your pastor, if you don't understand what's going on, you need to ask God for wisdom. Touch your mouth and pray. Come on, y'all. Folks, don't do that no more. And so you find these, this bird, even though it didn't, it was not beautiful, but it had wisdom about it. It knew how to bob and weave and get through storms. It knew how to get from wars. It knew how to not be fighting. It knew the bird knew how to go up a certain height and not get involved in the, in the storms that came through. So we thank God. God want us to renew our strength as the eagle. Can you say amen? Then you will also find out that the eagle, bless your heart, amen, had keen insight. Amen. And you could see, and I told you this before, that an eagle knows how to look at the sun and not even bat his eye. Because his eyes have been made on the side of his head and he can see ahead of him, but he knows how to see that sun. Bless God and not even bat an eye. And so you as a born again Christian, the Bible said, know them that labor among you. And then the Bible says in Luke 6 that we ought to know what manner of spirit we are of. Amen. You need to know yourself before you try to know anybody else. Turn over to 1 Corinthians, the second chapter. Oh, you in Bible school again on today. Bless God. 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, beginning at verse number 14. Let me read this to you rather quickly. It says, but the natural man... 
receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Why? For they are foolishness unto him. You're not supposed to go to church. And these things are foolishness. What I'm preaching is foolishness. But they go to church every Sunday, pay the dues, tithes, and everything. But it's still foolishness because they're not spiritual. You listening to me? Notice he says here, neither can he know them. Why? Because they are spiritually discerned. Now when a person is not born again, you can't only put a certain amount in them. Because they're not born again, they do not have spiritual things. Come on, y'all. And so the bird, the eagle, had keen insight. They knew how to discern. You must know how to discern what is God and what is not God. You must know what is truth and what is not truth. Know ye the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Come on, say amen. We need to know what a spirit of a lie is, what the spirit of truth is. So we need to know what spirit is prompting us. We need to know what spirit is prompting other folk. We need to know what spirit you're in, what's operating in the church. All the time, the same spirit don't operate. Some folk think it's time to shout all the time. Sometimes the spirit has got a solemn spirit, a sweet spirit, where we just stand and wait to the Lord and worship Him. Then there are times of jubilee spirit, where everybody dance and praise God. Then there are times where the spirit of prophecy will fall in the church, where the Lord want to speak to the church. Then there are times that the spirit of knowledge will be there, where people have a teachable spirit, where they're hungry and they want to learn and want to receive. You see, you, if you're not praying, you won't understand what spirit is going on. There's a lot of times, folks, that you must discern who you're working with, because a lot of us work around so-called Christians. And they go and they profess to be saved and you see all kinds of mess in their life. They profess to know God and I'm not saying be a judge, but Jesus said you may know them by their fruit. And then he said in John 6, judge righteous judgment. So what are you saying, preacher? How do you judge righteously through the scripture? And don't back down because you're the only one standing. You tell the truth and nobody don't speak to you. You tell the truth that they all separate from you. You know, normally during lunchtime, they come around your table. But when you go to call them the truth, they ain't going to come around your lunch table. They ain't going to offer you no apple. They ain't going to offer you no pie. And if they see you not eating, they ain't dumb. They know you're fasting. And they'll try to make jokes with you. Amen. But I'm here to let you know I'm not ready to joke today, Sammy. Just go on about your business because I'm over here reading my Bible. Somebody say it back. You see, years ago, folks used to have this thing about them that they used to shy away and be all careful and cautious and hide their salvation and hide their joy. I'm not hiding my salvation. Amen. The condition that this world is in, I think we ought to let it show forth. I mean with the condition that the households is in, that the churches is in. We ought to be glad that we saved. Somebody say amen. Oh yes. As I told you before, that the eagle blessed God only weighs about 8 to 12 pounds. And then the scripture tells me in the book of Hebrews, and I want you to turn there. Praise God. Let's turn there because I can quote it, but I want you to see it. Sometimes seeing, you know, will have it to stick with you a little bit better. Amen. Turn to the 12th chapter of the book of Hebrews, and it reads like this. Wherefore, seeing we are also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which do us so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Can you say amen? Now you see, just as the eagle, the eagle, bless God, cannot take off, bless God, with all of that weight on him. Bless God, he's not used to taking off with all of that weight on him because the eagle is known for its power. The eagle is known, bless God, for his strength. The eagle has a powerful flight. You know, like you take the airplane. They can just take off a few minutes, and the next thing you know, you'll be in the air. The eagle has so much strength in his pinions. Sometimes they call him pinions. Sometimes they call him wings, where he can just take a few steps, and the next thing you know, he's flying. Come on here. That's the way the born-again Christians ought to be. The Bible says, lay aside the weight. Anything that's keeping you down on the ground. Anything that's keeping you low below the altitude. Anything that's keeping you, bless God, from being where you used to be. Y'all still here? 
Amen. Anything that's keeping you, bless God, not praying, because you can tell when you're not praying, your attitude gets off. You're going fussing more than you usually fuss. Bless God, you get angry quick. Come on here. Amen. You're slamming and howling all the time. Bless God, you know when you haven't been praying, your mouth gets more rowdier. Bless God, you can't sleep at night. The television don't satisfy you. The children is on you. The wife or the husband don't satisfy you. You're going to talk in more than normal. You know when you ain't praying. I wish to have somebody there to say amen. Oh, my God. So today... Bless God, we've got to learn, hallelujah, how to lay aside those wings. I told you how the eagle spreads his wings. And when he spread those wings, he knows how to carry loads. You and I, bless God, have to learn how to open up the folks. And sometimes people have burdens. Sometimes people need encouragement. Sometimes people need a lift in their spirit. But if you're always down on the ground, and if you're always low in spirit, amen, can't nobody go to you. Come on here. Amen, can't nobody help you. Can't nobody stand with you in the name of Jesus. But that's why we got to wake up and put on strength. Come on, say amen. I'm going to tell you something else about the eagle. My God, the eagle, bless God, looks proud and fervent. Amen. The eagle, bless God, is courageous. And the reason why that the eagle carried himself that way is because it symbolizes freedom, bless God, and power. Now, the eagle don't fight much. They look mean, but they don't fight much. We as God's people, we must look the part. I don't see how you feel so justified. Amen. Earrings in their noses. They got them in the back of their neck. They got them, my God, red big old things hanging out their ear. Bless God. And it don't bother them and want to be called sanctified. And they say, well, Fred Price does it. Kim Copeland does it. And Jimmy does it. I'm not worried about Fred, Jimmy, or Kenneth. I'm talking about you. Come on here. We trying to copycat and these jack leg preachers are standing across God's pulpit saying, it's all right. Just come as you are. The Lord ain't looking at the clothes. I'm here to let you know that piece of line to you. Because the Bible said dress in modest apparel with shame faces and sobriety. When you dress with shame faces, your behind ain't going to hang out. Your legs ain't going to be all split up with a split. You're not going to look like a street woman or a street man. But you're going to carry yourself with a consecrated look and a godly action. You're going to look like it, smell like it, and act like it. My God, they come painted up look like Indians. Red lips, purple eyes, blue teeth, oh Lord. And it looks disgusted. And they think it looks cute. Come on here. Amen. Even though even the white children that try to be cool, they don't carry on like folks supposed to pick up anything. In the church, they look like anything. And if they got a preacher that's trying to preach and keep the folks sanctified looking, honey, that's bondage. Honey, that's no freedom in that church. The Bible says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. It didn't say if you can dress like you want, amen. And folks say, well, everybody's doing it. I'm not doing it. You ain't doing it, so ain't everybody. Bless God. And they say, look here, the, the evil, bless God, has a proud. Amen. Look, we ought to be proud of who we are. We are not to be ashamed to be called saved. We are not to be ashamed, bless God, to be a Christian. We are not to be ashamed because we carry ourselves and look like sanctified men and women. Don't you know you'll get respect better if you look the part? All right, you don't believe it? If you are trying to get a job, go look like a hobo. They ain't going to hire you. Hey, man, they want somebody that's decent looking, even if it's a factory job. They want you to come in looking right, shave, comb your naughty head, brush your yellow teeth, put on some clothes, smell right, take a bath. Y'all ain't helping me. Don't be walking in with old stinking sneakers on. Hey, man, you sit in front of me, smell the sneaker in the back. No, you put clean your nasty feet and wash your ugly body and get a haircut. Hello, hey, man, and then go and get you a job. Go in spirit of God. Go in faith. Go in confidence. Go in strength. Put a smile on your face. Walk in talking about Jesus. Let them know I'm born again. I'll give you a good day's work. I'm a good worker. I don't cheat on my hours. I don't smoke on my breath. Amen, somebody. That's how you do it. You got to tell yourself as a proud believer. You got folks that don't even know God, don't even have no sense direction in God. 
is looking better than Christians, acting better than Christians. It ought not to be that way. My God, it don't matter if you just come in the prayer. Don't come outside with your legs all husky. Come outside with your ankles all husky. Put on some nice stockings or something and look like a woman. Y'all don't like this, sister. I'm saying to brothers too, you ain't got no business coming out. Your pants all wrinkled. My God, wear those combat boots all the time. Bless God, go home and look like a man. Come out looking like a saved man. A saved queen man. Saved man. Oh, blessed name. It's right in hell whether nobody wants to say amen. So you understand <coughs> that the eagle, that's why I'm saying renew your strength as the eagle. Because the eagle had a proud look. The eagle was proud. Their eyes was on the side of the head, not even the front. They ugly, but they had a proud look. Praise God. And we, as black people, we've been beat down so much. We've been told you're not, you look like this and you look like that. And you spend all day, all your life trying to prim up and pick up. And pick lumps here and pick lumps there. Picking your eyes, picking your nose. Y'all don't like me. Bless God. But I'm going to tell you something. All you need to do is go back in history. The black woman is one of the beautiful creatures that God has ever made. But because you've been told that you look this way, you have this insecurity. You feel like you're not this and you're not that. But if you're saved, amen, have a proud look about you. I don't mean, mean to be proud in the flesh, but be glad of who you are. Be proud to walk down the street, walking like a saved woman. Some of y'all think it's cute when old no good pimps ride by and whistle at you. And hey, honey, can I go with you? And you laughing. God, but if they ride by looking at you, you are, you're not doing something right. Hello in here. Hey, Amen. And when they get out of the car, put them in their place. And you put them in the place, you won't have no problem no more. It's easy. Come on. How did I get? How can I make him leave me alone? You like it. That's why you. How can I make her leave me alone? You like it. Somebody say, man, if you really want to get that joker off of you, if you want to really get that rascal off of you, you can do it because you know how to do it. Oh, you never forget the bridge that brought you over. And always learn to love people. Huh? Amen. Always learn to give a smile because if you give one, you'll get one. You that want friends, start being friends. I didn't say find somebody and to be picky and to just get your little, you know, your little group. See, honey, I don't bother with everybody. I just got a few, praise the Lord, that I bothers with. And them is the only few that I bother. See, you're a hypocrite. Because that's not what the Bible told you to do. The Bible told you to fellowship one with another. I know everybody ain't going to do that. But uh, that's what it says. Huh? And we're still having prayer on after Friday night service now. Some of you that's not coming and supporting, you're not going to discourage us. We're going to stay on our knees. And one of these days, you're going to wish you was on yours too. Come on, say amen. These are days where it takes neology and Nebo City. If you don't stay on your knees, you can't make it. If you don't fast, you can't last. Hallelujah. So we want you to, to be obedient this week. And so I say, well, is he going to carry this all the way into Christmas? No, you can eat all the cookies and ham you want Christmas. We're not going to make you fast on Christmas. <laughs> Amen. But we just want you to be obedient. See, the Lord, when God gives the leader something, the only thing you're supposed to do is follow. You're not supposed to try to analyze nothing and go in no kind of book and try to find no answers. You just, Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. There's a need for this consecration. How many know that? There is a need for this prayer. How many know that? All right. In the book of Luke, the seventh chapter, we're going to begin reading at the seventh verse. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. For I also am a man set under authority, having under me soldiers. And I say unto one, go, and he goeth. I say to another, come, and he cometh. And to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned him about and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great a faith, no, not in Israel or even in the church. And they that were sent returning to the house found the servant whole that had been sick. And it came to pass the day after that he went into a city called Nain, 
And many of the disciples went with him and much people. When he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was the dead man carried out, the only son of his mother. And she was a widow, and much people of the city was with her. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and said unto her, Weep not. He came and touched the bearer, or some people call it the briar. And they that bared him stood still. He said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. He that was dead sat up and began to speak. And he delivered him to his mother. There came a fear on all. And they glorified God, saying that a great prophet is raised, as a great prophet is risen up among us, and that God has visited his people. Take your neighbor by the hand and say, neighbor, it's not over until it's over. Look at somebody with some fiber in your voice and say, neighbor, it's not over until it's over. Hallelujah. I want you to know that the enemy is a murderer. How many know that? The scripture declares that he's a thief, he's a killer, he's a destroyer, he's a murderer, he's an accuser of the brethren. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and that more abundantly. Religiosity is not going to bring the church out of the bondage and the captivity that it is in. It's going to take more than paperwork and certificates and degrees and quoting scriptures and Bible knowledge and Bible language. It's going to take a people that's sincere enough to come back to Bible days and prayer. You folks that have got lazy spirits, you're not part of the group. God is not looking for nobody that's going to try to fit him in. God is looking for people, amen, that want to get fitted in. Somebody say amen. You people, bless God, that don't, that's not sincere, you don't apply to what I'm talking about. Now the devil is on a, is on a rampage and he's trying to bring an end to our lives, to our ministries, to our visions. He's trying to bring an end to our families. Come on. To end the loved ones that we, the lives of the loved ones that we care about. But I want you to know it's not over till it's over. Amen. And the devil got many of you thinking this is it. I can't make it. I done tried all I can and it seemed like that all hell and broke loose. I can't make ends meet and uh, I just can't go any further. But touch somebody again and said it's not over until it's over. Amen. Now notice here, uh, there was a centurion after Jesus got done speaking in, 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 in Capernaum, which was the headquarters. Now Nain was 21 miles from headquarters. And after he got done speaking... As he went, there was a centurion who had a friend that was very dear to him. And he heard about the power and the life of Jesus. So he sent word. He sent servants to go and tell Jesus that the man that is sick, now he's worthy to be healed because, uh, you know, he, he, he's a good person in the nation. And uh, he's just worthy enough to be healed. He helps me around here and I need somebody to come and kind of lay hands on him and heal him. And so, now if you notice, in the fifth verse, where it says he loves our nation and he has built us a synagogue. He's a hard worker. He's worthy to be healed. But I want you to know the only thing that makes you worthy to be healed is your faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. Are you still here? A lot of times people think, you know, especially movie stars, who think that uh, if they donate a certain amount of money, to certain charity events, then that's supposed to qualify them for heaven. But it doesn't qualify you for heaven. Can you say amen? The only thing that makes you a candidate for heaven is salvation and living the life. Come on, say amen. Now I want you to notice that as Jesus, the Bible said he went, and then they saw, amen, Jesus afar off. They trouble not thyself, for I'm not worthy. The centurion said, wait a minute. I know I sent for you. I know I sent for you to bring healing to my household. But then when I think about the life that we live in, I'm not worthy for you to come. Not in my house. Can you say amen? 
Now, it don't matter with some folks. Some folks invite Jesus in and have beer on the table. Some folks will say, honey, prayer is going on in my house and you do more cussing in that house. <laughs> Somebody say amen. The Lord is in my house. The Lord is in my room because I pray. Amen. I don't know about the Lord is in there, but we got more than one person going in there. Now, see, the Lord can't be in there too much. Are you listening to me? Well, then, as we notice here, that the Lord told him, or rather the centurion said, if you just speak the word, just speak the word, my servant will be healed. Now, he said, I've got men under me, and I'm one under authority. I don't care who you are, you're under authority to somebody. Some folks don't want to be subject to nobody. But I don't care who you are, you're supposed to be subject to somebody. Can you say amen? He said, I've got folks going and coming. I say, go, they go, and they say, come, they come. But Jesus saw them and, 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 and saw how he was acting. He said, wait a minute, I say unto you, I haven't found so great a faith, not even in the church. Not even among them that's following me, I haven't seen the faith and the love and the unity that you have with your household. This ought to tell us a lesson or two. Somebody say amen. But then the part that he comes to, he said, now when they return back to home, they found that servant completely whole. When somebody's completely whole, they're complete. You don't have to add any more to it. Some folks are looking for complete healing, but they're not willing to go the way Jesus. When I say healing, I'm just not talking about your body now. Because some folks' spirit needs a healing. Some folks' spirits need a weight loss. Some folks' minds need to be healed. Some of our attitudes need to be healed. Come on, say amen. Now, when he got into Nain, he had to go a different route because he had just got done healing. And laying hand, or rather sending the word, he didn't heal, lay hand, but he sent the word, amen, to the centurion house. And there was a miracle that was wrought. Now the Bible said when he got into the city of Maine, his disciples was with him and there was a lot of folk with him. You would draw a lot of attention if you're doing something. Now folks, I want you to know, if what you're doing is not bothering the devil and not bothering nobody, you're not doing something right. You, you, what you're doing is supposed to stir up something. Everywhere Paul went, there was something that was stirred up. Everywhere Paul went, somebody didn't like him. Wake, wake up here. The Bible said, beware when everybody speak well of you. So everywhere you go, that doesn't mean you're supposed to make enemies, but it does mean that everywhere you go, there's going to be an enemy to the gospel. Maybe not your enemy, but an enemy to the gospel. Can you say amen? So I want you to know that everywhere Jesus went, there was somebody following him because they had heard about his ability to bring deliverance to sick folk. Amen. And the only thing that can hinder the Lord from working is your unbelief. And if you notice, the church has more unbelief in it than sinners. Now the centurion wasn't even saved. They wasn't even born again. They wouldn't profess to be nothing. He even told them, my house is so unclean. You, I'm not even worthy to have you in. But the sinner said, speak the word only. Come on, say amen. Some of us got Jesus speaking, the mother speaking, and the pastor speaking, and the deacon speaking, and everybody speaking. Ain't nothing happening because you of your unbelief. Come on, say amen. Notice here. When the Bible said he came nigh to the gate of the city, and there was a dead man that was carried, amen, along with his mother. Now, I want you to understand, a gate is for to keep that inside from getting out, and that that's on the outside from getting in. So now, when he got near the city, there was a funeral in process. Well, you don't see much going on now about funerals being stopped. Yeah, man, the only thing is, if it stopped, it's because, you know, the police stopped it. And fellas, in fact, the police is trying to keep them going. Somebody say amen. But then the Lord got near the funeral, and during these times in the Bible days, they would hire people to moan for them. You know, now we got enough folks that's hooping the house and trying to pull folks out of caskets and fussing in probate court about what mama left. 
But now this, these people had to hire people to come and help them moan for her son. And it seemed to be quite obvious that she didn't have, you know, a lot of time that with her husband because he had died and then here come the child dying and uh, she only had one kid. But then she thought that it was all over. I don't have nothing to live for because my husband is dead and my son is dead and I really don't have nothing to live for. And Jesus probably picked up on this, 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 probably picked up on this,